Welcome to Grand Rounds. It's my pleasure today to introduce one of our own, Dr. Savita Subramanian from the Division of Endocrinology. So she received a Bachelor in Medicine and Surgery from Stanley Medical College in India, and then came to the U.S. to complete her postgraduate training, including internal medicine residency at the University of Illinois, endocrinology fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis, and then finally a senior fellowship here at the University of Washington. She then joined the faculty at the University of Washington. She's currently an assistant professor, and she attends on the endocrinology consult services at both the University of Washington and Harborview. She's also the lead endocrinologist for the UW Medicine Neighborhood Clinic's Diabetes Health Integration Program. She's actively involved in teaching in the medical school as a lecturer on lipoprotein metabolism and lipid disorders. She's earned a number of awards, including Outstanding Investigator from the Western Section of the American Federation for Medical Research, as well as the University of Washington Loyalty Research Fund. Her research focuses on, the, on studying the inflammatory processes related to adipose tissue and obesity, primarily using mouse models. And we're happy to hear, have her here today to talk to us about lipid lowering, the story beyond statin. Please help me wa welcome Dr. Subramanian. Can you guys hear me? Okay, thank you, John, for that kind introduction. So the day after Christmas, uh, my boss slash division head slash mentor sends me an email saying, do you want to do this? Uh, essentially, the... Um, fine print on that is, you need to do this, this is good for your career. So I thought I'd use this opportunity to get you updated on what the latest is on lipid lowering therapy and to tell you the story that's now extending beyond statins. This is my disclosure slide. So today we will review the current guidelines for LDL cholesterol lowering. We'll understand what the role of combination therapy in lowering LDL cholesterol is. And pertaining to that, we'll discuss the utility of the newly available PCSK9 inhibitors in LDL cholesterol lowering. And we'll explore future directions and strategies that are being um, pursued for lowering LDL cholesterol. So over the last three decades, it's been well established that lowering LDL cholesterol reduces cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Several statins have come along. One has come and gone. Most have stayed. Several guidelines have come along, ATP 1, 2, and 3. And several primary and preve uh, secondary prevention trials using statins have pretty much established that lowering LDL cholesterols with statins is highly beneficial in reducing vascular events. So the standard of care until recently was goal-based therapy. To remind you, here in this table, the very high-risk individuals, we aimed for an LDL goal under 70 milligrams per deciliter. And for the individuals at lower risk, the numbers we shot for were about 130 to 160. So until 2013, we knew that there was a broad beneficial effect of statins in primary as well as secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. We thought that more intensive statin therapy is better than less intensive statin therapy, and possibly greater LDL reduction, lower LDL cholesterol levels may be better in reducing cardiovascular events. And then what happened? 2013 happened. Usually we have some memories that we try to keep in our heads that uh, help us remember years. 2013 was the year that the word selfie entered the Oxford Dictionary. The cronut came into existence. This guy leaked all kinds of documents. And there were many of us might have had babies, grandbabies. Uh, there was a royal baby, a Kardashian baby. But anyway, <laughs> a document that didn't get leaked ahead of time was the uh, AHA, ACC blood cholesterol guidelines, and it came out as an 80-page document, 80-plus page document, in November 2013. And this was the replacement for the ATP4 guidelines, which initially had started, but eventually was passed on by the NIH and NHLBI to the American Heart Association. 
So are these guidelines different? Yes, essentially they got rid of promoting specific lipid level goals, and they got rid of the approach that lower LDL cholesterol levels are better. They did say that it is possible that future clinical trials will, um, my, results from future clinical trials might um, provide information that will lead to rewriting or uh, revising the guidelines, and that ongoing RCTs of new LDL cholesterol lowering drugs in the setting of maximum statin therapy may uh, potentially give us information. So the 2013 ACCHA guidelines, which is now widely used in primary care clinics, identified four different groups of individuals who benefit from statins. The high-risk groups are the ones shown here, the ones who already have clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease that includes myocardial infarction as well as stroke, individuals with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and the individuals with very high LDL cholesterol levels, greater than 190 milligrams per deciliter. The optimal benefit is uh, with high-intensity statins, as recommended by these guidelines. And the individuals who are a little bit older or cannot tolerate the higher-intensity doses, we could potentially use moderate-intensity statins. And for primary prevention, using an, uh, an ASCVD risk calculator, we will prescribe statins based on their risk. And if it's a risk that's greater than or equal to 7.5% as um, revealed by the calculator, these individuals may need moderate to high-intensity statin based on discussion with the patient. So what are these statin therapy in intensities that's, that we're talking about here? So the high-intensity statin is the dose that reduces LDL cholesterol levels by approximately 50% from baseline. And the moderate-intensity doses reduce LDL cholesterol levels by anywhere from 30 to 50% on average. And the recommended doses for high-intensity statins are adorvastatin 40 to 80 milligrams and rosuvastatin 40, 20 to 40 milligrams. All other statin doses fall under the moderate-intensity or low-intensity statin therapies. Now, there was a risk calculator that was also released as part of this, these guidelines as pooled cohort equations. A risk estimator application was released as a web interface as well as now available for smartphones, and it utilizes traditional risk factors as shown here, age, race, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, systolic blood pressure, meaning hypertension treated or untreated status, diabetes, and current smoking status. Now, when this risk calculator was released it was in 2013, it wasn't tested prospectively for its accuracy in predicting cardiovascular risk. One of the big problems with this risk calculator is that age is the big driver. So the older you are, the more chances that you'll need a statin. And the U.S. and the world is a melting pot now. The risk calculator includes Caucasians and African Americans, but does not really uh, include Hispanics, Asians. And in those populations, there's a chance that there may be risk overestimation. So what are the implications for us as clinicians? So the positives are that these guidelines actually emphasize prevention of heart disease as well as stroke. The guidelines prior to this only talked about coronary heart disease, but now stroke is also included. It recommends more conservative use of statins in patients over the age of 75 who do not have clinical ASCVD, and possibly diminished use of surrogate markers such as CRP and coronary artery calcium scores. But these guidelines have received a lot of flack and haven't been widely accepted. And there are other agencies which have other in guidelines which still are goal-based and to have recommend targeted therapy. So the ma major criticisms are that, you know, we're abandoning dose titration. So we don't start low and go up on the statin dose. We just start at a moderate or high dose, and that's it. And after we do that, there's no recommendation to actually follow up on lab levels. So you just start them, and that's it. You're done. You don't have to follow up on lab uh, blood LDL cholesterol levels, only to ensure adherence. Uh, not to require intense, more intense therapy. 
they don't really recommend use of additional non-statin therapies, at least at the time the guidelines were written. They don't recommend, there are no recommendations. It's not that they're not, uh, they don't make any recommendations. It's not that they're saying don't use other drugs. And there's no consideration of real world cases. These, the, the data that they use to come up with the guidelines are all randomized control trials. And treat, patients in these settings are typically very well treated and highly monitored and not really real world. Other issues with the guidelines include that the risk calculator, at least at the time when it was released, did not, was not validated in, especially in other populations, such as Hispanics, Asians. The use of the risk calculator for primary prevention, the fourth group of individuals I talked about in the earlier slide, will result in starting statins on many individuals, and there's significant financial implications of that. They do not utilize any data other than randomized control trials, no epidemiologic data, no genetic data. And they also neglect to address management of other cardiovascular risk factors, such as triglycerides, HDL, and metabolic syndrome. Granted that the guidelines are clearly state it's blood cholesterol lowering guidelines, but for general cardiovascular risk reduction, it's important to address these other factors too. So it's probably time to already update them. And the reason for this is that the year 2015 was a pretty good year for the field of lipidology. So the results of the Improve It trial were published in June of 2015. The FDA approved two monoclonal antibodies for the treatment of genetic hypercholesterolemia. Alirocumab and Evolocumab are the two monoclonal antibodies that are now approved. And the results of two early phase injectable antisense oligonucleotides were published also. And these involved antisense inhibition of APOC3 and APO little a. So let's talk about ezetimibe. Ezetimibe is the focus of the Improve It study. And what is ezetimibe? Ezetimibe is an intestinal cholesterol absorption inhibitor. It inhibits the enzyme NPC1L1, which is the rate-limiting enzyme in the brush border of the enterocyte. It in, inhibiting this inhibits endogenous as well as exo exogenous cholesterol absorption. So when you don't absorb cholesterol through the intestinal uh, enterocyte, there's decreased cholesterol within the cell for packaging into chylomicrons. These chylomicrons go to the liver with lesser cholesterol in them. The liver doesn't get as much cholesterol and so lesser VLDL and therefore LDL particles in the circulation. So ezetimibe is by itself an inactive drug. It gets metabolized to its active glucuronide metabolite, and it circulates enterohepatically. And it's excreted mainly 80% in the bile, a little bit in the urine. So far, it's quite safe, and it's well tolerated. And reports of side effects such as hepatitis, myalgia, myopathy exist but it's mostly in conjunction with statins and are probably related to the statins more than the ezetimibe. Ezetimibe was approved by the FDA in October 2002 and started being available in 2003. By 2006, 15% of lipid-lowering prescriptions were ezetimibe. And this is without hard cardiovascular endpoint data. After 2006, the road got a little bit bumpy for ezetimibe, and the, its role for cardiovascular risk reduction had, became quite uncertain. And the reason for this were some, a few studies that came out. One of the most um, um, earth shattering for ezetimibe was ENHANCE. And in 2008, when this study was released, uh, this was a study which looked at very high dose simvastatin, 80 milligrams, with or without ezetimibe, in patients with genetic hypercholesterolemia. And they looked at the carotid intima media thickness difference between the two groups. Ezetimibe, when added to 80 milligrams of simvastatin, was highly effective in lowering LDL further compared to simvastatin alone, but there was no difference in the carotid intima media thickness. Now, this study, in addition to two other studies, the C's and Arbiter Hall 6, which looked at similar soft endpoints, received a lot of media publicity. And within a year, 
the prescription rates for azetamibe dropped by 50% until recently. So in 2015, the results of the improved reduction of outcomes by Torin Efficacy International Trial, or the Improve It study, were published. This was a study which recruited from October 2005 to July of 2010. And this was the pre-2013 guidelines. They used the NCP-ATP3 guidelines. These were individuals who were stabilized post-acute coronary syndrome, so ST elevation or non-ST elevation MIs, individuals who were either treatment naive with statins or previously treat treated with LDLs in the, one, in the 50 to 125 milligram per deciliter range. They were randomized to standard medical or intervention therapy. So the standard group were the individuals starting on moderate intensity statin with simvastatin 40 milligrams. Or the other group involved is the addition of ezetimibe to the 40 milligrams of simvastatin. Now, the study protocol involved up titrating simvastatin to 80 milligrams if the LDL was over 79 milligrams per deciliter. But in 2011, the FDA recommended not using 80 milligrams, so some of the patients got their dose bumped down to 40. So they looked at the hard endpoints here, cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, hospital admission for unstable angina, coronary revascularization, or stroke. And what did the data show? So looking at the LDL cholesterol levels, so the blue line is the simvastatin alone group, and the yellow line is the simvastatin plus ezetimibe, there was a significant reduction in LDL cholesterol in the combination group. And these are individuals who are already starting quite low on their LDL cholesterol, 70 milligrams per deciliter, and the LDL dropped in the combination group to 53, which is a 16-point difference. So it was effective. The combination was effective in further lowering LDL. What about the um, primary endpoint, which is shown up here? So you can see that the Kaplan-Meier curves are separated here. This yellow is the combination therapy, blue is the simvastatin alone. And it was significant. So this, there was a 7% reduction in patients who received, in, in the group that received azetamibe along with simvastatin. This was a modest uh, reduction, but these are individuals who are already quite well controlled on their LDL cholesterol. Now, this is a graph from the Cholesterol Treatment Trial Collaboration, which took about 20-plus trials of patients who uh, were treated with statins, and it plotted the risk of vascular events. And it shows here that essentially what this slide shows is the lower your LDL cholesterol, the lesser your chance of developing a vascular event. And if you plot the Improve It study on this, it falls right here at the lowest point, essentially meaning that if you get to a pretty low LDL level, your risk of developing a, a vascular event is quite low, suggesting that however, however you get to the low LDL doesn't really matter. So what are the lessons from Improve It? So essentially, from Improve It, we know now that LDL lowering by any means has a beneficial effect on clinical outcomes, and lower LDL levels are indeed likely better. The safety of ezetimibe has been confirmed, and it is also the first randomized control trial of a non-statin therapy targeting the small intestine. And it showed benefits that LDL reduction is good without actually invoking the anti-inflammatory and anti-thrombotic effects of statins that are often um, brought in, um, are referred to in trials, the pleiotropic effects of statins. So this is good. So we have two drugs now which uh, are beneficial in LDL cholesterol lowering. We have statins and azetamide. Do we really need any more drugs to reduce LDL cholesterol? So this is my patient, Don. He's 52. He has heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Essentially, he has very high cholesterols, untreated LDL cholesterols in the 300 milligram per deciliter range. And he had a myocardial infarction and a three-vessel cabbage at the age of 26. He was doing fine for 25 years, and then he developed angina again in 2015 on therapy and required percutaneous intervention. He doesn't smoke or drink. He's on four drugs for lipid lowering, rosuvastatin, azetamibe, colocevalam, a bilacid resin, and niacin. 
He also has type 2 diabetes treated with metformin. His BMI is 40. He has abdominal obesity, and he has thickened Achilles tendons. That's this pathognomonic of individuals who have familial hypercholesterolemia. And his A1C is 7%. But what about his lipids? So his treated lipids are shown here. His LDL is 127 on four drugs. So is that enough? He recently had an event on four drug therapy. So there are patient populations who do have an unmet need for additional LDL cholesterol lowering. And these are the individuals who are at very high cardiovascular risk. These are the ones who have had previous MI, strokes, also have diabetes. They have, they're difficult to get the goal. And 20% of patients with coronary heart disease are actually not at goal if we were to look at numbers as such. The individuals with genetic disorders, the familial hypercholesterolemics, these are individuals who have very high LDL cholesterol. Only 20% of them ever get to goal, whatever your goal might be, which is essentially as low as you can possibly go. The other group of individuals, and I'm sure you're familiar with this group, are the people who are intolerant to statins or averse to statin. And 10 to 15% of these patients show intolerance, and pretty much none of these patients are ever going to be at goal. So how can we help these individuals? For this, let's go over the cell biology of the uh, lipoprotein uh, LDL and the LDL receptor. So here is the LDL particle that's floating in the blood. And to get into the cell, an LDL delivers cholesterol to cells. And to deliver the cholesterol into the cell, it has to bind to the LDL receptor that's right here shown in the dark red. And it gets endocytosed. And the cholesterol then gets into the cell, and the LDL receptor is typically recycled back to the cell surface so it can go back and take up more LDL particles. Now, now we recently have known about this little kidney bean-like molecule called PCSK9. And I want to focus your attention to this kidney bean. What this little molecule, um, PCSK9, does is it binds to the LDL receptor. And so when the lipoprotein and the receptor get endocytosed, it's also part of that party. So what this PCSK9 molecule, this little kidney bean little thing here, does is it actually diverts LDL receptor for degradation by the lysosome rather than recycling back to the surface. So there aren't enough LDL receptors on the surface. So essentially, what is the impact of this molecule, PCSK9? It results in enhanced intracellular degradation of LDL receptors. This means less LDL receptors on the cell surface, not enough getting into the cell, so there's an increase in plasma LDL cholesterol. So what is PCSK9? It is the abbreviation for proprotein convertase subtilicin-like kexin type 9. Okay? All right. Uh, this is a secreted protease. It's 692 amino acid long, and it's primarily expressed in the liver, also in the intestine and kidney. And its only known substrate is itself so far. And it has a very short half-life. It's rapidly turned over in the plasma and removed by the LDL receptor. So how did we even come to know about this molecule? This is relatively new. So in 2003, in a French family, there was, there was a family which had all the features of the genetic hypercholesterolemics, the individuals with very high cholesterol, and these are the individuals who have <coughs> premature myocardial infarctions in their 30s, 40s. They have the tendon xanthomas reminiscent of uh, my patient Don. And these are the individuals, typically genetic hypercholesterolemia means you have mutations in the LDL receptor or the LDL um, uh, apo, lipoprotein ApoB. But this family did not have a mutation in either one. Instead, a mutation, a gain-of-function mutation, was found in the PCSK9 gene. Since then, several other mutations have been discovered. And the common theme of these mutations is that individuals with mutations in, gain-of-function mutations in the PCSK9 gene have very high LDL cholesterol levels, greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter. So they have severe hypercholesterolemia. So if there are gain-of-function mutations, there may be loss-of-function mutations, right? So a group in 
Texas discovered there are indeed loss of function mutations. They looked at the ERIC study population, and they looked at the individuals with lower LDL cholesterols. And the individuals who have loss of function PCSK9 mutations had lower LDLs. And the ones who had homozygous mutations had extremely low LDL cholesterol levels. Surprisingly, these patients had reduced cardiovascular um, disease, and they were completely fine. No, no other detectable abnormalities in the phenotype. So they're healthy and possibly even live long. So that's how PCSK9 emerged as a new therapeutic target for a treatment of hypercholesterolemia and related cardiovascular disease. So that was 2003. And since then, it's been a major therapeutic target. And to inhibit this, two different approaches have been used. The first approach is to, you, you know, you bind to the protein in the plasma using monoclonal antibodies or these special proteins called adnectins. Or you try to inhibit its synthesis. And this can be done with siRNA or antisense oligonucleotide um, methods. The monoclonal antibody approach has been the fastest. And two antibodies, the first and the second one here, the Regeneron and the Amgen products, have completed phase two and phase three trials and are now available in the market. The third drug, the Pfizer drug, is actually in studies but hasn't completed phase two or three trials yet. And there are several other companies that are working on this also. So how does the PCSK9 monoclonal antibody work? So here's the kidney bean PCSK9 here again. Um, and here's your monoclonal antibody. What that does is it binds to the protein and essentially prevents it from sticking to the LDL receptor. So when that LDL and receptor complex gets endocytosed, it, the kidney bean is not there. And so the LDL receptor is not broken down, and so it can go back to the cell surface and do its job. So since 2003, it's been quite rapid. And this is a classic example of translational medicine from bench to bedside. And starting in 2003, when this when the mutations were discovered in 2009, the first individual was treated with a monoclonal antibody against PCSK9. And since then, there's been phase two trials, phase, uh, and phase three trials have also been completed, 2014. Cardiovascular outcome trials have been started, and there's early cardiovascular benefit data as of last year, and marketing approval was received in mid-2015. So quite rapid, 2003 to 2015. So what's the key clinical information we can get from the phase two and three trials of these in, uh, inhibitors? So let's look at the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties, efficacy, and safety. So when, so these are antibodies, so given as subcutaneous injections. The red line here is LDL cholesterol. The green line is the kidney bean, PCSK9 protein. And this is the antibody. So you're starting off with somebody uh, who has very high LDL cholesterols right here, and they have high PCSK9 levels. The antibody is injected. Antibody levels are high. And what that does is your LDL, whoops, uh, LDL cholesterol drops, your PCSK9 level drops, and it lasts about 14 days, and then the levels kind of um, go down. So it's highly effective. So what uh, is the effect of these antibodies on LDL cholesterol? So here's evolocumab. And the top panel shows you every two-week dosing, and the bottom panel shows you every four-week dosing. And this is the decrease in LDL here based on different doses dosed every two weeks. And you can see that there's a, pretty, that there's a striking reduction here with the two-week dosing as well as the four-week. There's a little bit of bouncing, uh, but it's still quite low. It still stays low even with four-week dosing. And similar for alirocumab, which is this shows a combination of uh, dosing every two weeks and four weeks. The two weeks is flatter than the four weeks where there's bouncing, but the LDLs still remain low. So how do these work? Is there a limit to LDL reduction uh, with these agents? Yes, so once all the PCSK9 is bound, you won't get any further reduction. It'll just stay working the same way. And how does, long does the effect last? Based on the studies we know now, that the larger the dose, the effect is a little bit longer. But the problem with larger doses is that you need three times the more dose for a monthly injection. And so the volume of injection is larger. So what about over time? So the Odyssey long-term study looked at this. And at 78 weeks, you can see that there's a persistent reduction. 
in the LDL cholesterol levels, and the levels attained were 48 milligrams per deciliter and about 119 here in the placebo-treated group. And similarly with the evolocumab as a persistent, this is about 52 weeks, and that's the longest, 78 uh, uh, weeks is the longest that we have uh, duration-wise. What about the effect of these antibodies on patient, on patient, in patients on other therapies? So what about patients who are, are just on diet, meaning on no, no other therapies, on patients on different doses of statins or statin plus ezetimibe? So one study has looked at this, and that's the Descartes study using evolocumab. And essentially what this graph here shows is that there's a 50 to 60% reduction in LDL cholesterols, whatever method of treatment the patient is receiving starting from baseline. So I want to point out here, this is diet, this is drug therapy. The baseline is probably different for each group, but whatever your method of background therapy, the drop in LDL is about 50 to 60% with these agents when you add on the injections to uh, patients. What about other lipid parameters? Effects on triglycerides, is there an effect? It appears that these agents decrease triglycerides modestly and similarly, they raise HDL cholesterol. But the most remarkable or exciting effect is on lipoprotein little a. And lipoprotein little a, to remind you, is an apoprotein that's synthesized by the liver, and it goes and binds to LDL particles by this twingly uh, di disulfide bond. And what that does is it makes the LDL particle essentially stickier. And it's thought to be an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And there are no drugs available so far for reducing LP little a levels. However, these antibodies, the PCSK9 inhibitors, have shown both the drugs available uh, are, have now shown to decrease LP little a levels uh, quite significantly. So from baseline, with these agents, there's a 30% reduction or 25% reduction in LP little a levels. So this is quite exciting in the lipid field. And, uh, needs to be explored further. What about safety? I mean, these are injections. So, so far, 8,000 patients have been treated. There haven't really been any major side effects that have, been, that have come out. The subcutaneous injections appear to be well tolerated. Maybe this is fortuitous. Um, the jury's still out on that. We're going to have to see. Just a couple of weeks ago, there was a report that PCSK9 could potentially have a role in hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, it's a very preliminary uh, uh, study where they looked at gene expression of PCSK9 in the livers of these individuals, and gene expression was reduced. So it's, that's the only thing um, that I could find. So we're just going to have to wait and see. But injection site reactions have been reported in the phase two and three trials. It's essentially erythema or pain at the injection site, but quite tolerable. Other minor side effects, such as upper respiratory infections and nasopharyngitis, mild GI side effects, such as nausea and diarrhea, <laughs> neurocognitive effects manifested as confusion, memory loss. This was reported more recently in a couple of studies. It seemed to vary from visit to visit in patients, so it's really not clear. Ophthalmologic um, events have been reported in the same two studies that looked at the cardiovascular endpoints. But again, I, there weren't any details. Again, we're going to have to see what that means. But the most important thing I want to point out is that you, you get really low LDL levels with these agents. So how low? As low as 18 milligrams per deciliter. The lowest with statins in the Jupiter was only 44 milligrams per deciliter, and that was with rosuvastatin. So when you get such low LDL cholesterol levels, the accuracy of the Friedwald equation kind of becomes questionable. It may be affected because LDL, LDL cholesterol, as we measure it, they're not directly measured. They're, it's a calculated number. The other potential hypothetical risks associated with a very low cholesterol include the neurological problems uh, that I mentioned before, hemorrhagic stroke, intracerebral hemorrhage has been reported, hemolytic anemias because cholesterol is an important part of the cell membrane, uh, hormonal deficiencies, hormone background, back, backbone is cholesterol, and fat-soluble vitamin deficiency. So these are all things to keep in mind. But I do want to also point out the flip side of the coin is that there are two genetic conditions, the loss of function PCSK9 mutations that I discussed before, where the individuals have low LDL cholesterol levels and they live long and um, have no other phenotype. 
And additionally, there's a condition called hypobeta lipoproteinemia, essentially where these individuals have very low LDL cholesterols from birth and they live long and have no other problems. So there is the other side of the coin too. So summary of what we know so far with these agents. So we know the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties. We know that these agents are quite efficacious in various phenotypes, including patients who do not have a genetic hypercholesterolemia um, as monotherapy, just on, in patients with diet therapy. So in patients who are already on statins, it's also effective. Patients who are adverse to statins, I didn't show you data on this, but the GOSS study looked at this, and patients who have statin intolerance on, on the maximum tolerated dose were able to tolerate these agents just fine. And the individuals who have genetic, genetic hypercholesterolemia, the ones with heterozygous or homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Additionally, there also seems to be a beneficial effect on lipoprotein little a, an independent cardiovascular risk factor. So all positive. What we do not know yet is the long-term safety and tolerability. You know, these are injections. How long are patients going to take injections? And uh, cardiovascular outcomes trials are still emerging. But two recent studies have actually uh, looked at this in po pre-specified post hoc analyses. The Osler 1 and 2 trials were analyzed together, and that's what's shown here. And the Odyssey long-term have also looked at this. And essentially what this shows is that there's a cardiovascular uh, benefit with these agents. And uh, so this is, um, we, we need to know what the hard endpoint data are. There are several studies that are ongoing, the four-year Odyssey outcomes, SPIRE 1, SPIRE 2, and these are with three different antibodies as shown here. And the data is going to probably be um, out uh, presented at meetings as early as end of this year or maybe early next year. So what do we have available now? So we have monoclonal antibodies that are available. The alirocumab, which is a uh, commercial name is Praluent. It's the Regeneron product. And we have evolocumab, <coughs> Repata, which is the Amgen product. Both were um, approved in July, August of 2015. Currently, these drugs are indicated as an adjunct to diet and whatever statin dose a patient is able to tolerate, so maximum tolerated statin therapy. In individuals who have heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, these are the individuals with LDLs greater than 200 untreated, or maybe even treated, so anything above 200 on the LDL. Homozygous FH, these are the individuals who have extremely high cholesterols, untreated LDLs above 500. And then the individuals who have coronary artery disease, and not really genetic hyperlipidemia, who require additional LDL cholesterol lowering, so where the statins don't, are not enough um, to get their LDLs down. It's dosed as a subcutaneous injection every two to four weeks. Let's talk about cost. $14,000 a year. It's significantly cheaper in other countries. It involves a lot of paperwork, rejections, prior authorizations, so much so when we tell our clinic supervisor of PSS that we need to start somebody on this drug or that drug, this, we get an eye roll like, and a grunt. So that it's a hard work. So to summarize what we have with the two drugs that I discussed, the PCSK9 inhibitors and azetamide, statins reduce LDL cholesterol by about 40 to 60 percent. PCSK9 inhibitors also are quite efficacious to the same degree, 40 to 60 percent, and azetamide about 15 to 20 percent. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to get you up to speed on what the future of LDL cholesterol lowering looks like. So adnectins, I briefly mentioned this in an earlier slide. So this is something, again, I think it's funky. It's, these are proprietary fusion proteins. They're small binding proteins that bind to a particular protein target. So in the case of PCSK9, these adnectin proteins will go and bind to the kidney bean that's floating in the blood. So uh, these have a potential for lower cost, but again, 
we have no data, there's really no um, information that we have yet on safety, efficacy, or tolerability. So these will also probably be, most likely be injections, but um, again, something that companies are working on. Other approaches have been gene silencing approaches. So essentially, you stop the synthesis of the protein. RNA interference is one. So several co uh, companies working on this. Um, there are antisense <laughs> oligos. Essentially, you, don't, you prevent translation of specific mRNA. So PCSK9 would be a PCSK9 oligonucleotide given as injection. It would stop the PCSK9 from being synthesized. There's a company in Vienna, Austria, which is working on a vaccine targeting PCSK9. There's also another drug that's being um, evaluated. It's called bempedoic acid. It used to be called ETC1002. It's an ATP citrate lyase enzyme inhibitor. This enzyme pre is present in the cell cytosol. And what it does is it, it actually uh, enables the synthesis of fatty acids. So if you inhibit the, this enzyme, there's you know, decreased fatty acid synthesis and therefore possibly decreased VLDL, LDL synthesis. So what happens here is that these drugs inhibit LDL cholesterol anywhere from 25 to 30 percent. The drug has been studied in two doses, 80 and 120 milligrams, and there's a reduction in total cholesterol, non-HDL cholesterol, and LDL cholesterol as shown here. There does not seem to be any muscle side effects on in early studies, but again, they're still in phase two trials, so there's still a long ways to go, still being researched. There are other drugs that are being studied, new niacin-related compounds. Niacin is not completely out of the picture. Um, we're not gonna, I'm not going to discuss these, but just for your information. Uh, CETP inhibitors are not completely out of the picture either. They're being studied as LDL, potential LDL-lowering <laughs> agents also. There's second-generation antisense oligos being developed against other proteins. Called, uh, one of them is ANGPT-L3. This is a protein that's synthesized by the, it's a glycoprotein synthesized by the liver. It's important in lipid and glucose metabolism. Um, it, it ha in people who have loss of function mutations of ANGPT-L3 have very low plasma LDL cholesterol and triglyceride levels. So th there's a company that's working on this, on an ASO for this, in development for people with the genetic hypercholesterolemia, as well as for people who have severe dyslipidemia, combined pattern, um, elevated LDL, as well as triglycerides. And then lastly, and this is my last slide, this is the funkiest thing of them all, genome editing. And I'm not really sure if any patient will actually buy into this, but it's being worked on. So what is genome editing? Editing. It's uh, essentially you can edit the genome. You go in with these specific nucleases, which are essentially scissors uh, for DNA, and they can go and cut your DNA and replace it with. If you don't have, if you have a gene that isn't working right, you go and cut it off and put put something else in. So that is being actually worked on for PCSK9. So PCSK9 gene dis disruption is uh, be is. Um, actively being worked on. So, so to summarize all the new things that are coming up, it's an exciting time for clinical lipidology. PCSK9 inhibitor, monoclonal antibodies, adnectins, siRNA. Um, these are all different approaches. They'll probably all be injections. CTP inhibitors, ATP citrate lyase inhibitors, new niacin-related agents. These are all some of the things that are coming up. So in conclusion, I would recommend to use the current ACCHA guidelines with caution until it's updated. Evidence regarding combination therapy is accumulating. Uh, we have uh, data on azetamide now, um, and it's uh, actually beneficial. However, uh, we have new drugs that are in our armamentarium such as PCSK9 inhibitors, which will address a lot of the unmet clinical need for further LDL cholesterol lowering. However, there are lingering questions about neurocognitive uh, adverse effects. You know, how low can the LDL go? Is that a good thing? So these are all questions that remain to be answered. There is uncertainty about how patients will embrace regular injections. You know, patients with diabetes take insulin injections if they need to, uh, but this is 
hypercholesterolemia is a chronic asymptomatic condition. How long are they going to take injections for this, for primary prevention in some cases? And cost is a major concern. And there are many new complex therapeutic innovations that are being worked on and that have the potential to address unmet needs for cardiovascular risk reduction. So and with that, I will finish. And I want to thank a few people uh, who are very important. Uh, they're the reason why I'm here today. Uh, Dr. Alan Chait, my mentor and maybe work dad kind of situation. Um, uh, Dr. John, uh, if I learned everything I needed to know from research, uh, for, uh, about research from Alan, I learned everything I needed to know about clinical lipidology from the late Dr. John Brunzel um, in the lipid clinic. Dr. Bremner, who likes to take selfies, I didn't put it in because he didn't show up today. Um, <laughs> but he likes selfies. I have one from 2013. Um, and uh, Dr. Page, um, who is also um, a friend and a champion, um, and Dr. Hirsch, uh, who I love dearly for reasons he knows. So uh, with that I'll finish and I'll take any questions. Is there evidence with other monoclonal antibodies that over time the manufacturing can reduce the cost of these incredibly expensive drugs? Can you, uh, can you repeat the question again? So what's the, can you, I missed the first part. Is there evidence that over time manufacturing of monoclonal drugs can bring the cost down to some reasonable level? Yeah. Is, there, is there evidence that with time, uh, uh, when more monoclonal antibodies are available, will the cost come down? Well, if, I'm, if I were to compare it to diabetes where we have new drugs which make you pee out sugar and the cost is quite high and there's three different drugs, I don't know. Um, it's a possibility. I would hope that would happen. Will it happen in the near future? Highly unlikely, but maybe down the road if it becomes the standard of care, just like statins. Um, Thank you. Um, I do want to make a point. So uh, I'm assuming everybody heard that. So with, uh, with regard to the point that, you know, there may be certain populations which may benefit more. So yes, uh, there's act in the Improve It, there's actually, it seems like the patients with diabetes seem to uh, benefit better than the ones without diabetes. And your point is well taken that these changes are really small. It, is it true that some of the people with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia lack LDL receptor. How is this uh, antibody supposed to work when you genetically lack an LDL receptor? Yeah. So the question is, uh, so p patients with, so the antibodies are approved for use in patients with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. The, and Dr. Rosen brings, an excellent, brings up an excellent point where these are individuals who have pretty much zero LDL receptors. So if you don't have an LDL receptor, how is this drug going to work? 
Yeah, so avalocumab, only one of the antibodies are, is even approved because they do, did studies only in that group. But there was an LDL reduction in those individuals, and it appears that there may be uh, other pathways that we still don't know yet that seems to benefit. But the LDL reduction is not as robust, but it's still beneficial. And these are individuals who typically have uh, MIs in their teens and, and are a on apheresis, so anything you can throw at them is beneficial. But yeah, so only one of the drugs is actually approved for the homozygotes. Yeah. How do these numbers compare to bypass procedures? Ooh, I don't know the answer to that. I'll have to look it up. I, I don't know. What? <clears throat> I enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. I, what's happened to low HDL as a target for therapy? So uh, the question is, what, what, what's the deal with HDL, a low HDL, specific to a low HDL? Well, HDL is a, a hot-button topic, really no real answers right now. Um, the, 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 the NICE and trials didn't pan out. So there's a lot of active research going on, but uh, is there anything definitive? The CETP inhibitors are, haven't completely bitten the dust. Uh, so there's a couple of companies still working on it, but beyond that, I didn't go into HDL because it's very controversial. It's a confusing area. Uh, it's more about HDL functionality and not the number. So at this point, uh, jury's still out. I yeah, that would be the summary of <laughs> what I would say about HDL. Hi, Alan. <laughs> um, so the qu first question was about CTP inhibitors. Uh, I think they'll bite the dust. I don't think there's much there left because most of the trials haven't panned out. There's been negative consequences, maybe off-target effects. Uh, I wouldn't buy stock in the company uh, making. <laughs> but uh, triglycerides. Um, a huge area of research uh, for cardiovascular risk reduction. Again, uh, there is, um, you know, hints that there may be a causal effect of triglycerides. So um, that's a whole different topic and a whole different talk, which is where I initially started off with. So we won't even go there. But it's uh, there's a lot of exciting thing going things going on in the field of lipidology, as you know, and APOC3 inhibition. Uh, is a big one, which is um, one of the apoproteins on triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, and inhibition of that um, uh, is being actively studied. So um, that's a talk for another day. <laughs>